couple of years ago, June 25th, 2017, First Baptist Church of Dallas had a worship service. Oh, big surprise, it was on a Sunday, it's what they do. Now you can imagine First Baptist Church of Dallas. That's a little bigger than where we are right now. Just a little. However, this was a different kind of worship service. It was a patriotic service. An armed honor guard marched into the sound of a military snare and presented the colors in the auditorium. They had fireworks, I mean, big boom fireworks in the auditorium. Songs were sung, but they weren't like what we were just singing about the glory of God and his awesome power to save. No, they were songs like, uh, it's a grand old flag and this is my country. Remember, when we were kids, we would have these programs at school and they would sing these songs. You remember the, remember the line from this is my country? It goes like this. I pledge thee my allegiance, Jesus Christ the crucified. Remember that? No, you don't, because that's not, the, that's not the line in the song. The line is, I pledge thee my allegiance, America the bold. Now, the reason I mention this, and I could give many more examples. If you, if you really want to know how churches approach the Lord on a Sunday morning, there's a website that used to be called the, A Slice of Laodicea. Just a little peek into what goes on. I don't know if that's still the current one, but there's a couple of sites where they'll, they'll show the video and, you know, whether it's a trapeze artist or his pastor comes in on a zip line or drives a Ferrari up on stage, I, you know, you name it, they do it. The reason I mention this is we're seriously confused and conflicted when it comes to public corporate worship. And it seems that Southern Baptists can be among the worst offenders. So here we have a church that is committed to the full authority of the Bible, this Dallas church, to the Baptist faith and message as the confession of faith and to the gospel. And, and yet I have to ask the question, was this service of corporate worship done according to any regulations found in the Bible? Well, like I said, there's plenty of examples to go around. And I'm not really concerned with I'll just say who they are. The Episcopals with their Buddhist priestess coming up front and blessing the congregation or, you know, any of that stuff. The, the liberal Lutherans do this, uh, PCUSA. Women wearing clerical collars and robes. And, you know, I mean, we shouldn't be surprised, though, because they don't believe that the Scripture is God's inspired authoritative word. It's, it's not part of their bailiwick. Thinking about us, as Christians, as American Christians especially, as Southern Baptist Convention Christians, trying to be faithful to the Lord Jesus, trying to be faithful to what we know to be true, and, and anyone else who would stand on the Word of God. So last week we considered how sin has to be dealt with before worship can take place. We saw that with the example of Christ ministering to the woman at the well. That's from John 4. I'm going to jump off of John 4, but I'll be jumping into a lot of different passages this morning. It's not really an exegesis of John 4, but I wanted to put it in this series because we were talking about worship. Remember the woman at the well tried to change the subject when Jesus says, go call your husband. I have no husband. Well, that is true, but it wasn't the whole truth, was it? No, she'd had five husbands. That's why she was an outcast even in her own town of Sychar. And then she changes the topic to, our fathers worshiped on that mountain, which would have been Mount Gerizim within Ishot. Well, we touched on this topic, so I'm going to read, reread verses 23 and 24 from John 4, and then we'll talk about worship. Jesus speaks to the woman and says, But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. 
So I want to repeat a little bit of what I said last week, and then it gives us some context. Fact is that all of life is to be subsumed in service to God, in worship. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies living sacrifices, holy and pleasing unto the Lord. This is your spiritual service of worship. So that's, that's the 24-7, 365. It happens continually. You offer your bodies. You don't offer them to the enemy or to the flesh, but you offer them to God. And our spiritual service of worship consists in presenting ourselves, body, soul, and spirit, as living sacrifices to God. This is done, of course, in response to what God has done for us and through Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. It's not what we do. It's what God has done in sending his son to be the propitiation for all of our sins. And this is the fundamental nature of worship. It's God who initiates and then we respond. So we could say that worship is the appropriate response to God's revelation of his, his own character and his works. We praise God for who he is. We praise him for what he's done. We praise God for what he's promised to do in the future. The Old Testament Hebrew word for worship literally means to bow before, to bow down. I, I remember hearing Francis Schaeffer on, on, in his books and on tape. Remember tape? Um, he would talk about when those converts to Christianity, you repent and believe, you put aside sin, and he would he'd always use the expression, bow the knee to Christ, which I think in Dr. Schaefer's defense, he was in the milieu of ask him into your heart, and he was trying to be a little more biblical and say, no, you bow the knee because he's the king. For remember that David bowed to Saul, and Ruth bowed to Boaz. As Why would they bow? Well, because it literally means to bow down to someone in acknowledgement of their superiority and your own relative inferiority compared to them. So it could have been a cultural concern in those days, but it certainly means that when we come to the God of the universe, our attitude should be one of bowing before him. His redemptive works, his righteous demands are only known through the revelation that we have in Scripture. We know that God reveals himself in creation. We know that no man has an excuse to stand there and say, I don't think there's enough evidence to believe in God. Well, you're just lying and you're deceiving and deceived yourself. But by common confession, our sole infallible standard for all things, faith and practice, is the Bible. So I want to talk about corporate worship, that is, as a body. And if your ears are attuned, you're, you're probably not going to hear me say anything about music at all. Other than I want you to know I'm praying for a drummer and um, praying for a bass player, unless you want me to teach you bass, Jason, I'm sorry. So that we can have a bigger group of musicians. I'm praying for a skilled drummer. So join me in praying, God send Syracuse Baptist Church a skilled drummer. One that won't blow the room out with one rim shot either. <laughs> that can happen. But let's just in, un unpack this a little bit. Corporate worship. What does it mean to worship in spirit and in truth? You'll find some outline on the on the back of the bulletin. I wanted to do this because I, I know this is going to be a lot of content. What does it mean to worship in spirit, first of all? Well, it means to worship him spiritually. Now, when I say that word spiritually, your mind is probably going to kind of ethereal clouds and non-physical and just kind of up there. No, spiritually in the Bible means without sin because it's always compared to and contrasted with the flesh, 
which is of sin, the, the sarks, Greek word, used in that context. It's either of the spirit or of the flesh. So we want to worship God spiritually, knowing that our sins have been, have been dealt with on the basis of Christ's perfect work, his atonement on the cross, and our reconciliation to God as a result of this atonement. It's a wholehearted, it's, it's all in. And it's a faith that is worked out in single-minded devotion and faith to Christ. To worship God spiritually means that you do so on the basis of your for, forgiveness and your reconciliation with God. That's why Jesus had to deal with the sin problem with the woman at the well. She can talk about worship all day long, but unless you repent of your adultery and now fornication, you can't worship, and it doesn't matter where it is. It has to be in spirit and truth. So that's the first one. To worship him in spirit means to worship spiritually. Second of all, to worship God in truth means according to his standards of truth. It means to offer him obedience and worthiness based on his own revelation as found in Scripture. So it means according to God's standards in truth. And these two concepts can't be separated. Like I said last week, you don't have the, the spirit church over here where they have the tambourine and they're dancing around, and over here's the truth church where they all have a notebook and they're taking serious, copious notes. Let me get that reference, Pastor. Yeah, No, they're both connected. They, they can't be separated. Spirit without truth leads to shallow and overly emotional experience that's almost like a, a high. As soon as the emotion is over, when the fervor cools, well, so does the, the worship. How many of us spent time in churches where if you didn't get that feeling, man, you just hadn't arrived, you know? <laughs> oh, I didn't press in enough. And I, I didn't do enough to get that little buzz. We wouldn't have said buzz, but that's kind of what it means. And then truth without the Spirit can result in a dry, passionless encounter that can easily lead to a form of joyous legalism. You know, tick off the boxes, make sure you got your right. Some of, some of the most arrogant people I've ever met were little teenage fighting fundamentalist kids, you know. They all had the short sleeve shirt and the black pants and the shiny black shoes and the ties. Oh, my goodness, I wouldn't have trusted them as far as I could throw them. So why don't I mention flags and fireworks? Or, or videos, or zip lines, or skits, or cars. Here's the thing. We live at the early part of the 21st century, and we have 2,000 years of church history behind us to look to, and then another 16, 1,700 years of Hebrew history. So there's a rich source of material that we can look to and say, okay, does God even care about how we worship him? So there have been two basic ways of looking at this through history. I, I like to use the terms that are, that are recognized. I don't want to make up something new and then have to reinvent the wheel, okay? The two recognized patterns or philosophies that are used to determine what goes on in a church on any given Sunday are the normative principle and the regula regulative principle. You have the normative principle of worship and the regulative principle of worship. First of all, on your outline is the normative principle, and it basically means this. If it's not forbidden, then you can do it. That's a very simple definition. Trust me, there have been volumes and books and articles and lectures on this topic for a long time. But this model is the one that was adopted by Luther and later on by the Church of England. It's, it's one of the reasons that if you attend or visit a Lutheran church or an or a Episcopal church or Anglican, it's going to remind you of another way of worshiping. It looks kind of, anyone? Catholic. Yeah, it looks, it looks and feels kind of like a Roman Catholic service. The normative principle of worship basically claims that if God doesn't forbid it in Scripture, then it's allowable to do for his glory. In this view, historically, 
since a lot of the outward forms of Roman Catholicism wasn't explicitly forbidden in the Bible, then Luther and some of the other reformers said, well, let's go ahead and keep that as part of corporate worship. What's the harm, you know? If God doesn't condemn it, then we can do it. Well, you can see how if, if un, undisciplined by any other standard, this could lead to all kinds of goofiness and silliness. It could be abused and taken to all sorts of different levels. See, our problem is that we're humans and we're selfish and we will go to almost any length to please, our, please ourselves rather than God. So I like to think in terms of all of God's people from the very beginning. Can we honestly say that if God doesn't forbid something, then it can be used for his worship? What if some Sunday morning you showed up here to Syracuse Baptist Church and we had two clowns at the back door with balloons and streamers and little flyers? Welcome, welcome, brother, to Syracuse Baptist Church. It's, it's going to be fun day at the church, and it's all part of some kind of outreach to kids or whatever. How many of us would say, man, I'm, I'm glad we're moving forward with this. This is, this is good, you know. Actually, that happened to a friend of mine, and uh, his response wasn't quite as casual. When we're discussing this topic, we need to think in terms of, okay, we're God's new covenant people. What kind of relationship, if any, do we have to the old covenant people of God? Remember, Paul wrote to the Corinthians and talked about those incidents, historical narratives in the Old Testament. And he said, those are written as examples to us so that we don't fall into sin. What, what examples? Well, what was the singular offense that God's people kept committing over and over and over again in the Old Covenant? Anyone? Idolatry. Thank you, Pauline. Yeah, you get a gold star later. <laughs> yes, idolatry. Over and over. God said, if you obey me and keep my laws, your cattle will have more cattle, your sheep will have more sheep, you're going to have babies, your enemies will be defeated, it just will go well with you. But no, they kept going back and going back to the bales and to the Ashtoreth poles and to the, the craziness of pagan worship. And usually idolatry has two different aspects, two different ways to commit it. Either you worship someone or something other than God, or you worship God in the wrong way, in, a, in an unholy way, in a common way. And Israel did both. Of course, they went back to false gods. You know, those gods promised a lot of fun. Of course, they also demanded your firstborn so that your crops will grow. And they also offered what was called strange fire, and they made a golden calf and said, oh, this is God. We're worshiping God, don't worry. And we know that most manifestations of worshiping someone other than the true God, they usually tell us in their statement of faith. You can usually find it. I, I'm thinking of the, the three big non-Christian sects that we're, we're familiar with. I mean, how many of you have been at home on Saturday morning and there's a couple of guys and they're carrying a satchel and they're dressed very nice? Jehovah's Witnesses. Right, they'll tell you right up front they don't believe Jesus is God. Or the Mormons on their bicycles with the little el elder Petey wheat straw, you know. They have more gods than the Hindus. So, you know, we got a real issue there. Even, you know, United Pentecostals, Hebrew root movement, they have the wrong God, they have the wrong Jesus. It's a matter of explicit statement of faith. But what about this second aspect of worshiping the true God in the wrong way? Wow, we don't, we don't want to do that, right? <laughs> That's not good. The golden calf is probably the most obvious example. And in Leviticus 10, 1 and 2, reads this way. Now, Nadab and Abihu, or Abihu, 
the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And what was the result of this unholy worship? Yeah. Fire came out from the Lord, from the presence of the Lord, and consumed them, and they died. See, the point here is that God had clearly commanded one thing, but they did it their own way. They did another thing. They did it according to their own imaginations. In that principle in the Old Covenant, we find it in, in Hebrews as well. Exodus 25, he told Moses, see that you do this, you make this tabernacle, you make this after the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. In other words, it's got to be a certain way. It has to be like this. Everything was to be done exactly according to the model that Moses had seen, in which everything was particularly described and nothing was left to the will or imagination of man. Now listen, I'm only giving these as examples. I don't want to freak you out and say, well, if we turn to the wrong hymn number, God's going to strike us down. That's not the point at all. <clears throat> you see, most standard evangelical churches will follow some kind of normative principle. If God doesn't forbid it, then do it. It doesn't mean they don't believe the Bible. I, I'm not saying that at all. It does mean that they're open to novelties that just may actually get in the way of biblical worship. Vody Bauckham calls this the effective principle. He's, he coined, he did coin a new one, but it's kind of related. He called it the effective principle in which everything in the local church is done to the end of, or to the, for the purpose of uh, touching your heartstrings, making you feel more close to God. And it's usually based on some kind of emotion. I think there's a better way. Here at Syracuse Baptist, we follow what is called the regulative principle. And it basically means this. If it's not commanded, then don't do it. Very simple. It means that we should only approach God in worship the way that he has described that worship in his word. If God doesn't specify it, then we shouldn't employ it as a means of worship or as a means of coming into his presence. In other words, if God has not approved it, those kind of means and methods and manners in worship aren't, aren't to be done. The one thing we know for sure, that the Bible speaks of this, and it's true, and it regulates everything, and this must also include the regulation of corporate worship. Our Confession of Faith says this in, in chapter 22, verse 1, the acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself and is so limited to his own revealed will. He's speaking of the scriptures there, his own revealed will, that he may not be worshiped according to the imagination and devices of men, nor the suggestions of Satan under any visible representations or any other way that's not prescribed in Holy Scripture. You may be thinking, wow, that sounds... Sounds like a big red light on almost anything. Because what is the Bible specifically explicit about when it comes to New Testament worship? Well, listen, if you were here and remember the series from 1 Timothy, remember the whole point of Paul writing that letter to Timothy was what? So you know how to behave yourself in the household of faith, which is the church. He says in verse uh, 315 of 1 Timothy, I write to you so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. So obviously, just to take it from, from that perspective, obviously there are certain behaviors that are acceptable and even desirable in the local church, and there are certain behaviors that, that are not. It's not man's preference that gets to decide what's acceptable in the gathered assembly or even our own opinion that dictates these kind of boundaries. It's God's word that provides the boundaries. And God has clearly established them. If we operate solely by this previous normative principle, 
which is generally fueled by a desire to appease somebody. Now, who are they trying to appease? When, when the pastor comes in on a zip line, yeah, I'm, I'm not making these up, though. These are real. And the sad part is, Judy, they are Southern Baptists who did this, right? Or he pulls in in a Porsche. Or they have a, a group of people up dancing and doing this kind of interpretive thing. Or what about the guy who says, I, I preach the gospel, but I use oil-based paints. And he paints a picture. We've all seen this, you know. These kind of strategies it usually turns worship into some kind of entertainment. And the church is a community kind of social club where it's pretty cool. You get you to watch this guy paint a painting or see a cool video and all these. I'm not saying you can't use video. We've used videos here too. But really, this is not what God intends from the beginning. I think there, there are two reasons that I not just prefer the regulative principle, but I think it's important, and it's the reason that it's in our confession of faith. First of all, remember, we stand on the word. The Holy Spirit had reasons to authorize in Scripture what he authorized. Ask yourself, do you know why God put everything he did into the Bible? Not really. But he says in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord. His reasons that he hasn't given, we don't sit there and try to figure out, well, why would God have to send us? And why does it have to be like this? God's the one who has spoken and revealed. We don't, we don't get a second guess, the creator. So presumably, he had reasons that he wanted the gospel spoken in words rather than drawn or painted on a canvas in the gathering of the church. What are those reasons? Maybe it has something to do with the power of images. I, I don't know. We genuinely don't know. But what we do know is that the New Testament, our infallible authority, clearly gives the church the authority to preach using words, to sing and to admonish and to celebrate the Lord's Supper and to baptize. It says nothing about flags or worship dancing or fireworks. I often think of Nadab and Abihu and their fire, and I look at the fireworks, and I'm like, you guys are coming pretty close to strange fire here. <laughs> Boom. <clears throat> so first of all, the Spirit is the one who directs us. Secondly, in all of life, human beings are generally authorized to do only what God authorizes us to do in the first place. Let me give you an example. Many of us in this room are pretty skilled at the use of the old chainsaw. I know one guy, really, I got to call you, I got a tree, it's leaning weird. But we, we run a chainsaw. Has God authorized us to use a chainsaw? Well, yeah. It's okay to take creation and make culture out of it, whether it's firewood or timber for a, for a new table or whatever. Genesis 1 actually gives us that authority, plus the principle of private property, so we don't cut down somebody else's tree. That's pretty important. So with anything that a church does when it's assembled, God must authorize those activities as well. The church isn't a place where we get to just make stuff up and say, well, here's what we'll do. I think this would be cool. When we go beyond Scripture, go beyond what is written, there's a, there's a risk here. We risk binding the consciences of others without any scriptural mandate for it. I mean, think about it. What is sometimes forgotten in these discussions is that there's an important role that your conscience has to play. Without the regulative principle, we're at the mercy of some worship leader or a bullying pastor who, if you don't do the worship like they're saying to do it, you're displeasing God or you're not participating according to this manner. They made something up, and yet if you don't do it, you're looked down as, you know, you're not really spiritual. The beauty is that when we realize that this regulative principle, when applied to public worship, 
it frees the church from acts of impropriety and, frankly, idiocy. We're not free, for example, to advertise that we're going to have clowns at our door for next week's Sunday service. That's just silly. But it's not just common sense. It's the Bible that tells us that clowns aren't supposed to be. How do I know this? Well, the fact is that lest you think we're going in one direction, I want to assure you that this doesn't result in some kind of cookie cutter approach to church. I pastored 11 years in a church where every time we would confess, we would literally get on our knees. Looks Catholic, but it's biblical. But we don't have to do that. I'm thinking of a lot of you really would have trouble getting back up again. <laughs> hey, now. Hey, tell it like it is, you know. No, there's not some kind of liturgical sameness that has to take place in the regulative principle. Within an adherence to this, there's enormous room for variation. There's all kinds of freedom in manners that the Scripture hasn't specifically addressed. Let's, let's flesh it out practically. Let's take a step back. What does the New Covenant Church do? What are they supposed to do? Well, let's look at a little bit of history here. Um, the very, very first group of Christians, Acts 2, 41 and 42. So those who received his word were baptized. Well, right there, you we're Baptists. You don't get baptized until you receive his word. So I'm sorry, there goes baby baptism out the window. What can I say? There's something, though. The very first group, heard the word of God, repented of their sins, and they were baptized. What else? Verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. What's that sound like? Teaching, fellowship, meals, prayers. It sounds like basic Christianity 101, like a Baptist potluck, you know. 1 Corinthians 11 talks about when you come together, when you come together as a church. Paul addresses what they needed correction in, but he doesn't say, well, let's, let's just meet once a month. That way you're not tempted to do this whole getting drunk thing. Or he didn't say, let's, let's only have the Lord's Supper quarterly. That way it's special. No, he just said, when you come together, have this attitude Discern the body, discern the other believers, and don't take the supper with known sin. Examine yourselves. In Colossians 3, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. There's the music. Songs hymns, psalms, spiritual songs. Hebrews 10 and 12, we're told, consider how you may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up the meeting together of ourselves as some are in the habit of doing, but let's encourage one another and worship God acceptably with reverence and awe or holy fear. Paul told Timothy, devote yourself to the public teaching, the reading of scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. In Ephesians 5, 18, don't get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in, again, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. For the first 30 years of my Christianity, I attended churches that did not take up an offering. They had a box in the back. There's nothing wrong with that. But is, is taking an offering like we do acceptable? Well, yeah, sure it is. Nothing wrong with that. 1 Corinthians 16, 2. On the first day of every week, that's now the first day of the week, put something aside and store it up so there'll be no collecting when I come. In other words, every Lord's Day, Everybody put a little in. That way, when Paul comes and he has a special need, he doesn't have to say, now listen, Corinthians, let's do this. 
See, we know for a fact that the church was doing these things. These are the basics. There's the regular meeting on the first day of the week. There's, there's preaching. There's teaching. Reading the word. Praying. Singing together. There's giving and there's fellowship. And there's the Lord's Supper. They had elders and deacons. And they had an attitude of reverence and holy fear. It wasn't just a breezy, casual, wow, this is just like going to the hardware store or Walmart, you know. No, it's, it's just different. This is special. So one more note about this, and then we'll close. If you look at your bulletin, if you have one, you can see th some things that are delineated in bold print. I talked about the call, the call to worship. So there's five, five steps in, in, in how we do this anyway. First, we have, a, we have God call us. That represents the, the call of the gospel. If it wasn't for God's effectual call, none of us would be saved and none of us would be Christians. God had to initiate. He had to say, you, come and worship me. So we gather together and praise him. Then he calls us to confess our sins. We confess, and what is God's? God initiates this, and then how does he respond to our confession? He cleanses us from sin. That's 1 John. Then there's consecration over on the second page, the preaching of the word. This is where the word of God, as applied by the Spirit, convicts our hearts and cuts us up, as it were, like a sharp two-edged sword doesn't let us just remain whole in our own attitudes and sins, but it constantly conforms us to the image of Christ. Then communion. God communes with us. Communion is primarily about communing with God, not merely with each other. We eat God's food. He said, bread and wine, this is what you do. And then finally, the, the final one is commissioning, where we respond in obedience. We march out of here faithfully and go about the Great Commission in whatever vocation, calling God's given you. See, throughout the whole service, God initiates and we respond. God speaks and we listen. God gives and we receive. God acts and we thank him for it. God sends and then we go. This is, this is basic to Christianity. So finally, as, as I close, I want to get back to this issue of, of spirit and truth, what really, really matters. This is the final part of your outline. We love that verse in Isaiah, Isaiah 1.18. It's just so comforting. It says, come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. That's so reassuring that God has made this salvation so complete and perfect. But if you consider the verses that occur right before verse 11, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me? Here's God telling his old covenant people, I don't care. What, are, what, are, what is this to me? I've had enough of burnt offerings of ram and the fat of fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no more. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon, Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I can't, cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. If you jump down to verse 16, remove the evil. Here's the point. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan and plead for the widow. In other words, you can have all your ducks in a row and worship according to an external form. But if your heart isn't in the right place, God doesn't care. It doesn't matter. In Psalm 51, after David's horrendous sin of adultery and murder, 
And Nathan the prophet, you are the man. I'm talking about you, David. And he repents before the Lord. His repentance looks like this. 51, 16, and 17 from Psalms. You do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are what? A broken spirit, a contrite and broken heart. Oh God, you will not despise. See, God's primary concerns is that we first approach him according to his mercy and his grace. That our lives are not characterized by hypocrisy or double-mindedness, but by total allegiance to Jesus Christ. I mean, I have to confess, on my best day, I need to be cleansed from my sin, encouraged to walk wisely. I want to ask you this. Have you experienced not only the disintegration that comes from God's presence and the awareness of your own sin, but also the power of God's free grace and forgiveness? And as Isaiah said, after confronted with the majesty and holiness of God, he says, here I am, Lord, send me. In other words, is there a, a willingness on your part to obey what God has said? And I don't think morbid self-introspection is the answer. I think we need to look to Jesus. If you're one of Christ's, then you look to Christ as your surety. No one can obey God without the Spirit. As Paul said, no one can say Jesus is Lord without the Spirit of God. So is God pleased when we meet together? Well, it starts here. It starts with, it starts with you. Was God pleased with the big patriotic service in Dallas? Man, I don't know. That's, that's hard for me to wrap my brain around that a meeting that was intended to bring glory to Jesus was pointed somewhere else. And I think that's the, that's the lesson we can take from that. When we come together, make sure that we're, we're pointing to Jesus. Make sure that I point you to Christ. Not to anywhere else, not to me, I'm an idiot, but only to the Savior, to the Jesus who lived the perfect life and voluntarily laid his life down on the cross so that all who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. Amen? All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you that you don't leave us to our own devices or to the, to the tyranny of, of novelty. And Lord, we thank you that you take pleasure in the worship of your people as it is offered in faith. And Lord, we thank you that you've rescued us from idolatry. You've rescued us from all manner of silliness and novelty and all because of your word as, as applied to our hearts by the Spirit of God. Lord, I pray that as we continue on as a church, that we would grow in, in maturity, that we'd also grow in numbers, that you would continue to bring the people of your choice into our assembly. And help us to always keep our eyes on Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. We ask it all for your glory. Amen.